It's a pleasure to welcome uh, Guy Lippens today to present the work of his group at the TBE. Um, just to briefly introduce uh, Guy's career, he studied engineering at the University of Ghent in Belgium, uh, followed by a master's at Cornell and a PhD back at the University of Ghent. Then in his next 20 years or so, he spent at, uh, in Lille at the Institut Pasteur and the University of Lille and moved to Toulouse in 2015. So in Lille, uh, the group that he built up there gained a uh, considerable international reputation and um, to the extent that it was chosen for the site of the, the first 1.2 gigahertz NMR spectrometer in France. And I believe Guy, you're still involved in that project. Uh, and in his research, he's maybe best known for his work on the protein tau. And for me, this is important for, for two reasons. Firstly, it's contributed significantly in understanding Alzheimer's disease, but also it was a, long before it became fashionable when most of us were studying well-structured domains, he was already looking at uh, what we now call IDPs, intrinsically disordered proteins, and de developing methods and uh, uh, recording important results on those. So today uh, he's going to talk to us about fluxomics by NMR, brackets, or how a bacterium reproduces itself. So I'll hand over to Guy, and uh, we should have the screen shared. I'll turn my mic. I think, okay, thank you, Andrew. Uh, I don't know, you can see my screen now? Or For me, for me it's fine. Yeah, okay, so I, I guess it's fine for most people. So thanks for this uh, nice and kind introduction. Uh, indeed, um, it, it might be kind of surprising for many people that I'm looking at bacteria while having looked at human proteins for most of my career in Lille. Um, but that was kind of the deal when I came here. So when I moved uh, from Lille to Toulouse, uh, um, the CNRS kind of asked me to insert myself in this laboratory, the Toulouse Biotechnology Institute, which at that moment was still the LISBP, unpronounceable in English. Um, and so with two uh, kind of main missions. The first one was to introduce protein NMR into this institute where there's a lot of protein engineering, enzyme engineering. And so indeed, uh, it still is a major part of our activity. And when I say our, so our team has been joined by Cyril Charlier as a CNRS researcher uh, very recently, a year ago, something like a year ago. And the second part was to kind of see if I could contribute to this fluxomics by NMR, um, which for me was completely different. I, I have to be honest, I had never recorded an HMBC spectrum of my life. Uh, J-resolved spectroscopy was completely unknown territory because I had been focusing on protein NMR. And so introducing myself in this small molecule in MR and this, in this kind of techniques was, was uh, interesting and challenging at the same time. So how I like to introduce this notion of fluxomics is, is, is in this uh, first slide of exponential growth that all of you know pretty well, specifically the people who work on, on bacteria and uh, so it basically is a bacteria every half an hour or an hour or whatever divides multiplies by two by four by eight and so we go on but if we think about it it's kind of amazing it, it means that in this short time period half an hour the cell makes a copy of itself so it makes every single DNA molecule, RNA molecule, protein molecule, lipid molecule, metabolite, sugar, whatever you want, it, it synthesizes them in a very short period such that it can divide and make two identical objects. It's, it's like a factory that would be able in a given time to reconstruct a second factory next to it, the building, the machines, the people, whatever. And so even though we are used to it, it remains very amazing and understanding how this happens is kind of what metabolomics tries to do. And we understand a lot. We understand a lot. We get to this very complicated maps where we know that if glucose comes in, I, I hope you can see my cursor, but well, I, as I don't see you, I don't know whether you see it. I, 
just shout if you don't see it. So you get in with glucose, glucose gets phosphorylated, that's the glycolysis way. So most of this has been discovered in, I would say, the first half of last century. And the citrate cycle was done by Krebs, who got the Nobel Prize in 1953 for this. Um, to be honest, these are really heroic efforts. Eh? People who, who established these maps with the analytical methods that they had at this time, they merit all our um, consideration because it's it's much more complicated like this. You see, we, we show this pentose phosphate pathway here as a box, but actually, if you look at the box, it, you'll see that itself, it's a completely very complicated things where molecules feed back, they, they inhibit other enzymes, they, they stimulate enzymes, they... So how can we get into this very complex thing? This was central metabolism. If we look further, for example, amino acid synthesis, uh, you see here just the glycine synthesis is extremely complicated because metabolites come in from everywhere. And again, all these enzymes work together in a concerted way, but in a very adaptable way as well, which means that in different physiological conditions, this network rearranges, but is still feasible and still leads to life. And what today I will concentrate on is, is this branched chain amino acid biosynthesis, valine, leucine, and isoleucine, which is, seems like a simple thing, but as a chemist, you would never do it. If you had to synthesize isoleucine, you would never combine threonine and pyruvate to get to this. Bacteria do it, and they do it in a very complex way. So how can we find out this pathways? How can we find out these reaction schemes? And how can NMR contribute to them? Well, this was started by uh, Thomas Zipersky when he was working with Kurt Wittrich, the Nobel Prize in chemistry in late 90s for protein NMR. But Thomas Zipersky, he proposed to use NMR for looking at this biosynthesis. And the idea is pretty simple. It is if I introduce a label, so an isotope, for example, carbon-13, I can look by NMR to see how it distributes over the different molecules. And so this here is a molecule of a glutamate, for example, something like this. We have a connection between the beta protons and the alpha proton. And so we get to this kind of peak like this. Now, if we introduce carbon-13 in there and it ends up in the C-alpha, well, the C-alpha will split as a doublet and we can actually see those peaks and so say, okay, indeed, this glutamate molecule got some percentage from the C-alpha position, from the, from the C-13 labeled glucose at the C-alpha position. If it's rather the gammas that get the C-13 incorporated, we will get a line like this. If it both of them get C13, we'll get a more complex square pattern and we get like this. So just by looking at the satellites, the C13 satellites, we can get, because Thomas Sipersky proposed, to get insight in the flow of carbon into different molecules. And I think that's the very important thing to remember here what we want is not as much the identification of molecules, but we want to see the flow of carbon, labeled carbon-13, inside the molecules to learn about precursors, where does the carbon come from. Of course, the problem is that you can do this pretty simply on an isolated peak like this. You can see the satellites, but for example, if you're looking here on a zebra mussel extract that we were asked to look at by Sophie Prudhomme in the context of an ecological uh, project in monitoring of water quality. Uh, you get many peaks and you can imagine that looking at satellites in such a spectrum becomes complicated. It's moreover complicated because actually every peak doesn't show up as a single peak, but it has this multiplicity due to proton-proton couplings. So again, 
this is very NMR technical for you, but it means that we'll have to adapt methods to clarify this flow of carbon. And so in this next slides, there will be a lot of NMR technical thing that most of you can just even not even listen to it, but just look at the resulting spectra. And that's what I'm asking you. To get rid of these homonuclear couplings, for example, this being a doublet, people have used this kind of uh, 2D experiment, which is called J-resolved, where in this dimension, we get the proton-proton couplings. In this dimension, we will only get the chemical shift. And when I arrived, that was the state of the art. That was the state of the art. So that's a spectrum from the lab, where here you will see the carbon satellites that actually show that it's the bronze chain amino acids that are C13 labeled on the methyl. These are the methyls which are not C13 labeled. But of course, there's the methyls in there of the isoleucine, leucine, and valine together, and the resolution is not good enough. So the question was, can we make resolution better to distinguish whether carbon flew into the isoleucine, leucine, or valine uh, methyl groups? So then we have to go to the NMR and actually understand why we don't have good enough resolution. And the reason is pretty simple. Uh, we get pretty bad proton resolution here because we don't take a lot of points and that we don't take a lot of points because we actually decouple. We, ca we decouple the C13 to get the two lines on the same vertical, okay? Um, if we would decouple much longer, resolution would become better, the frequency becomes better defined, but we would probably blow up the probe. So people didn't want me to blow up the probe because a probe is kind of expensive, specifically when it's a cryo probe. So the idea was pretty simple, take out the decoupling, that way we can measure longer. And I'm showing here the picture of uh, James Keeler, who's actually now head of chemistry at one college at Cambridge, and who's a remarkable man because he, um, he was director of teaching for over 20 years, undergraduate teaching. And he explains all these kind of uh, pulse sequences in such a way that when you're listening, you to understand what's happening. And then he stops and you try to reproduce it and you're completely incapable of it. I think he's really the, the, the expert in explaining simple things in a way, complex things in a very simple way, in a manner that afterwards you don't understand it anymore. And so that's why I'm trying to show his picture. Okay, so what we're doing here, we take out the decoupling, we get a better, higher resolution spectrum, but we get four peaks. Higher resolution in the sense that we can now get this proton-proton coupling pattern over there. We don't want to multiply peaks, so can we actually just maintain only two peaks? Again, very technical. If we take out this pulse, that's the result that we have. We keep the very good resolution. We only have two peaks, but now they're spread out in the proton-carbon coupling. Again, very technical. Just look at the spectrum. The spectrum looks more doable in that way. Can we get rid of these homonuclear couplings, this square, homonuclear square? Again, look at James Keeler together with Pell, Andrew Pell. He wrote the Pell sequence. We applied it, and indeed, we we're able to get to such a spectrum. That's kind of akin to what people are doing now in modern day, uh, present day, high resolution NMR spectroscopy of small molecules pure shift spectroscopy has gained a lot of attraction. Pure shift means that rather than having all these coupling constants that make multiplets that are hard to distinguish in when there's many people, many peaks together, we get one single peak per proton at the expense of a sensitivity. We lose a factor of 20, 10, 20 in sensitivity. So one of the people heralding this is Garrett Morris, who's in Southampton. And so he's worked a lot on this stuff. Now, okay, we try to combine all of this stuff. And if you're asking, how do you do this? Well, it's pretty simple. You invite Davy Sinave, who at that moment was a postdoc with Garrett Morris. He comes over in three days, sets it up. 
and it worked. And so we could publish it. And at the same time, Dave Sinov now joined the CNRS. He's a CNRS researcher in Lille and still very active in this development thing. So don't try to understand this thing and even don't ask me for all the details. The result is interesting. So here we have a sample of alanine. And we're going just to look at this methyl group, just at this methyl signal, which couples with the H alpha and therefore gives a doublet. In the classical JRS, we have this doublet in both dimension. Palenkiller sequence, we get the doublet into a single diagonal. And if we do it um, with the Psyche um, pure shift spectroscopy, we get a single peak. If we look at the molecule, which is C alpha labeled, C13 labeled at this position. Now the proton will still couple with the H alpha, but the proton will also couple with the C alpha spin plus or minus. And from this already a little bit complicated because here we mix homo and heteronuclear coupling constants. We get to only the heteronuclear coupling constant left, which allows actually to measure how much C13 we have at this position. Same thing if we are CO labeled, we have the proton to C CO coupling constant. And if we're uniformly labeled, we get some kind of triplet. That's a simple case. But what if we look at the H alpha proton now? The H alpha proton will be coupled to the three protons of the beta group, the methyl group. And this is it becomes pretty artistic. Eh? Imagine that if you have this on a t-shirt, it's kind of nice. But with the pure shift uh, sequence, we still see it's a singlet. We get the coupling between the H alpha and the um, C beta when the C beta is labeled. We get the coupling with the CO when the CO is labeled. And here, when we are uniformly labeled, we are not at zero hertz anymore. We will be at 70 hertz because indeed there is the coupling from the H alpha with the carbon alpha and then with these small ones. But we can again distinguish it. So this method should allow us to get to a better resolution and see where carbon is flowing. And let me go back to our bacterial sample. So this is E. coli grown on what we call the Pascal triangle acetate. So we take the three, the four forms of acetate with no carbon-13, carbon-13 only at this position, only at this position, or at both positions in equimolar uh, quantities, we feed the bacteria with this. And as a result, uh, Pierre Millard here in the lab has shown that every single carbon position at whatever molecule in the bacteria has 50% of chance of being labeled. So this was our JRS experiment. If we take this very complicated thing that Davy developed, we get to this kind of spectrum. And that's interesting because now if we zoom in on this peak, first of all, we can give them a name. We can say this is the valine gamma one delta. This is the valine gamma two. And we can even distinguish this valine gamma two from the isoleucine gamma two, even though they're extremely close. And we see this pattern. This is this pattern, which is only the proton carbon couplings. There's no proton proton couplings involved anymore, which makes life simpler. And because we know that we've grown the sample on these Pascal triangle acetate forms, we can actually measure the integrals of every of these peaks. And again, so this, we're looking here at zero hertz. So it's this gamma, uh, which is carbon 12, always carbon 12. And no, every other carbon has 50% chance of being carbon 13 or carbon 12. So that's the molecules, the fraction of molecules where the three other carbons are carbon-12, gives you a singlet, because there's no more proton-proton couplings. If there's a single carbon which is labeled here at this position or this possession, we get a doublet. If there's two carbons labeled, we get a triplet. If there's a three carbons labeled, we get a quadruplet. And our real signal is a sum of all of these. That's the theoretical values. 1.6, 9.4, thing like this, just by taking that every position has 50% of chance of being C13 or C12. And that's the normalized intensity that we find on the spectrum. And you'll see that we're basically within 1% 
which is pretty good. Even for mass spec um, standards, this is a pretty good uh, demonstration. Now, what can we use it for? Well, what we tried to do as a simple example is going back to this isolution biosynthesis. And as I mentioned, this was done mostly in the years, in the first half of the last century. Uh, there's this Professor Umberger from at Harvard who actually spent 10 years on it. it it's really extremely complicated pathway because Pyruvate will condense with this ketobutyrate or oxanobutyrate to give a molecule where two carbons come from the pyruvate and four carbons come from the ketobutyrate, which actually comes from the threonine. So what we did is we grew a sample of E. coli on a mixture of threonine unlabeled to make it cheap glucose uniformly C13 labeled, which gives you the uniformly labeled pyruvate. And then we're going to look at the resulting isoleucine. And what we see actually for isoleucine, so in black, it's the Pascal triangle. Everybody has 50% chance of being C13 labeled. In red, it's the sample which was grown on glucose C13 labeled and unlabeled threonine. What we see is for the delta, it's actually on the J equal to zero axis. So it means it's unlabeled carbon. For the gamma here, it is on the J equal to 60 Hertz. We fold in for that's again, very technical. We have the sample over here. So it means that this carbon is C13. But now if you look at the pattern of this thing, we see that this carbon here actually couples on a long distance to a C13. And it's the same for this carbon. It couples on a long distance to another C13. So it means that indeed there is another C13 in there, which will be the beta one. So we have a 3J coupling from the proton to this carbon 13. We have a 2J coupling from this proton to this C beta, which is C13, confirming what Umberger found in 10 years in one overnight experiment. So the method is extremely um, powerful in detecting very tiny details of how a molecule was constructed in a cellular context. Now, you might say, okay, the method is very powerful, but looking at this kind of very complicated spectra, I don't want to do this. I have a lot of money. Why do I need to go to such a complicated NMR, I want to do it with 1D NMR and buy a bigger magnet. And so that's indeed, I've been, as Andrew said, I've been involved in this uh, 1.2 gigahertz machine, which will be installed, which is a machine from the national infrastructure that will be installed in Lille. And hopefully in um, October, November of this year, it should be there. Uh, the advantage of being involved is that I followed it very closely. And so I asked Brooker whether I could run a spectrum at 1.1 gigahertz. And we took this bacterial sample just as a test case. And it, it's kind of amazing because what, what you see is that the J coupling and this 160 hertz between proton and carbon here, it's on the tyrosine actually, is field independent. And so it's field independent. It stays at 160 hertz. Only if you translate it into PPMs from 0.32, you go to 0.15 PPM. So the peak look more narrow, but even though in they're exactly the same, separated by the same amount. The chemical shift between different peaks is actually independent of field if you express it in PPM. It's always 0.3 PPM like this, but that in, in Hertz becomes different. And as a result is that the difference between satellites actually becomes field dependent, whether you express it in Hertz or in PPM. The result is that if you look, this is the same sample, exactly the same sample that was run here on the 500 or the 800, and then in Zurich on the 1.1 gigahertz, you don't recognize it even. It's very amazing. On such samples, if you change fields, you don't recognize them. And if you look here at the pure shift spectrum, you see we have eight Hertz of difference. If you would like to separate them actually at 100 hertz, 
you would not need a 1.1 gigahertz, you would need an 8 gigahertz. So there's still time for this. So very increasing field strength is not an alternative for this kind of measurement. Of course, once you do this, people come along and they say, well, I'm doing this in a biotechnology thing. I would like to play with my microorganisms. For example, I'm going to increase this kind of this enzyme. I'll make you 64 strains with more like this. Can you analyze it? And then we have a little problem because these experiments are long. Uh, they're 2D, even 3D experiments. We need long relaxation delays because of relaxation values, blah, 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 the whole thing like this. Uh, and so if they come with 64 samples and you need one day per sample, it's two months. So, so, it's, so the question was, can we do this faster? And that was actually the first question that people asked me, can we do this flux things faster? So what I proposed is to grow the bacteria on N15, which is pretty simple. Eh? Ammonium chloride and 15 people who do protein NMR know this pretty well. And so I used my background of protein NMR to try to see whether we could not apply this in a similar way. So we have really amino acids. Eh? The samples, they're the bacterial pellet hydrolyzed by HCl overnight, 110 degrees, six molar HCl. So nothing remains. It's free amino acids. So they're NH3+. Plus. But if you're at low temperature and very acidic pH, we actually can see these NH3 plus things. And a lot of people in, in the protein NMR here, Marius Chlor, they looked at lysine side chains, the NH3 plus. They developed this HISQC experiment where you have to be careful not to have D2O in the sample. So you need an insert in this. And we can actually get to pretty well resolved peaks of this sample, this lysed sample. Assigning is exactly the same thing with the protein NMR sequence, now adapted not to NH, but to NH3+, but that still works. We can go to the CO assignment as well, again, and so we could, in a, I would say, a rather simple way, determine that indeed we have 14 amino acids that survive this very harsh treatment. Once we have this, we can, of course, combine it, for example, here an HISQC with a TOXI experiment. And the very interesting thing is now that if we look at a sample which is on the Pascal triangle, we see the alpha proton, which is linked to a C12 or to a C13 over there. And we can integrate those peaks to get to an idea about C13 incorporation. Now, normally we would do the experiment at four seconds, but because we start with magnetization and the NH3 plus group, which relaxes extremely fast because it exchanges with water, we can actually do the same thing on a one second experiment. Now, the result is that if this experiment took four hours, this experiment takes one hour. And so it's a true advantage to be able to start from magnetization on the NH3 plus group and to accelerate this kind of measurements. Then again, we can use our HNCA experiment, for example, if we want to quantify what the amount of C13CO, and so here the question is, can we quantify blocks of carbon uh, content, not only at one position, but the block C13 at the C alpha, CO, C beta form, we can take in CO decoupling or not, we can get actually the doublet if we are uniformly labeled or the triplet, which is the C12CO and the C13CO is still the doublet over there. Again, very technical, but the amazing thing is if we do the simulations, it's hard to distinguish the experimental value from the simulations. And so that's even more amazing if we look at a complicated amino acid. Again, here we look at the lutecins. We could get to perfect match with between experimental values and theoretical values on a rapid time scale. If we want to look at the quantification of the C alpha, if the C13 CO is there, there we run into problems because now we can't start anymore from N15 labeled protons. We have to start from the real H alpha. And so going through things did not work out and the reason even we could assign them but the reason is this t1 time and again for protein for people who are in protein nmr 
what we do know is that we deuterate proteins such that the C13, C alpha, does not see a proton anymore. And so this proton doesn't help to relax the carbon 13 of the C alpha position. Well, the inverse is true as well. The proton actually H alpha will relax differently whether the C alpha to which it's linked is C13 or C12. And the difference can be huge. It can be actually a factor of two, for example, here for the alanine or for the leucine, we see it's a factor of two 470 milliseconds or 870 milliseconds. And for other, for the alanine, it's, it's even worse. It goes from 750 to 60 milliseconds. So this here would mean that we need three T1s. We need the experiment, which is with four second uh, relaxation delay, which is actually pretty long. So in the end, we managed to absolutely quantify the block in a C alpha CO block with very simple reasoning if that then we can get to the relative value but we know the absolute value thus we get again to the absolute value it's pretty simple mathematics as long as we're on a simple system if we're on more complex systems we get to things like this and so pierre miard and andre sokol here they developed what they call isosolve which is um i would say a formal method to generate these equations and to feed in um, experimental input that can come from whatever method it can come in from mass spec and mass spec will tell you the amount of molecules that have no c13 that have a single c13 that have two c13 but will not necessarily give you positionally dependent uh, incorporation to get a mass spec, to get an NMR, they formally solve all these equations and they give us output the different, the abundance of the identifiable species on a way that I showed you before. So we then did it indeed on this thing where we looked at flow between the glycolysis and the pentose phosphate pathway, where we actually lose one carbon in CO2. And we could show, we could confirm that increasing this enzyme hardly increases the flux through the uh, glycolytic pathway. Only when you cut this enzyme to zero, then indeed you decrease the flux through the pentose phosphate. And so we're using this now, the advantage is that the four samples could be run actually on one single day and 24 hours was what we gave us. Now, could we go further? And so that's a more recent um, experiment that we're trying to do. Could we actually use these extracts for strain optimization? So it's very different in scope. Before, what we did is we grew the bacteria and then we lysed everything to look at the resulting carbon-13 incorporation. Here, we're making an extract which is active so we are very careful we don't lyse anything with hcl high temperature and thing like this we're going to use or sonication or a french press and we hope that we get enzymatic that we maintain enzymatic activity to the highest extent in this extract of course we we're not working with full cells so for example the membrane fraction we lose for example, the DNA, we lose it there. So there will be no more um, upregulation of certain enzymes or something like this. But the soluble enzymes, we keep on them. And so here, what we're doing, we're using this E. coli extract and we're adding, for example, glycose. What we see is that we see signals that disappear, signals that appear, signals that will come up and then go down again. So we can hope that they're intermediates. And we get to a very complex thing over time. And so that's what I call a movie of the cell extract. We're going to see how it reacts when we introduce a perturbation, which would also mean that we can do strain optimization. For example, if we can identify one enzyme that's a bottleneck, then we could just add this enzyme to this cell-free extract, see if the bottleneck now has gone, and before we're going to introduce this enzyme in a mutant bacteria, which takes time. Here, adding the enzyme specifically when it's commercial is a very simple thing. We can just buy it, 
add it to the cell extract and run the experiment again. Of course, we can also take pictures of this. For example, here a picture would mean that at this time, we're going to take the cell extract and we're going to quench it. Quench it would, could mean that we heat it, that we freeze it in, in, in an organic solvent and thing like this. And this way leaves us with a picture of what the uh, extract was at this moment. And this leaves us with the time to analyze it. Because of course, one of the problems here, if we see a peak that comes up and goes down, and we don't know who it is, what molecule it is, the information content is lower. So we can take pictures at different moments just by quenching the extract and analyzing it. And when doing this, we realized that um, we had a lot of these phosphometabolites in this central metabolism, because in glycolysis, we know that you start from glucose to glucose 6-phosphate, then fructose 6-phosphate, 1,6-phosphate, and things like this. How can we analyze them actually in the spectrum of a very complex mixture without physical separation? Because if we're going to physical separation, we're meaning we're going to LC, then we have LCMS, which is probably going to do the thing better than we do. And so we went back to our J-resolved experiment and said, well, what if we add a phosphorus pulse in there? It would mean that in one, if we add it, then we have the J-coupling that evolves in both T1 and T2. So it will be spread out along the diagonal. If we don't put it in, then it will be refocused one another. So it will not be, it will be the black spectrum where the J-coupling with the phosphorus nucleus is like this. And if now we do a different spectrum and we show only the positive contours, the blue one should remain. Whereas for every proton that is not coupled to a phosphorus, well, if you make the difference, the signal disappears. So we can actually use this pulse sequence to isolate phospholinked protons, which are the, so part of phosphometabolites, in a complex mixture without any physical separation. Now we're going to combine this with what we call a proton phosphorus correlation experiment. And so here again, we developed this kind of what we call Zerter, where you extract this very small slice of this high re resolved spectrum which is specific for only the phospholinked protons. We're going to extrapolate it to a proton carbon, proton phosphorus 2D spectrum, where we get the different protons of this molecule. And with this spectrum, we can actually go back to our initial J resolved spectrum, where we have the proton phosphorus coupling like this. And I draw your attention to this. This spectrum is actually of better resolution, even than the 1D. And that way we can assign our 1D spectrum because that's the aim. If we want to assign our movie, then we need to put names on the individual peaks during this thing. So this is the glucose 6-phosphate in a synthetic mixture like this. But now if we go to a real extract, you see the real extract, this proton spectrum becomes pretty complicated. Now, if we look at the JRAS different spectrum where we see only the phospholinked protons, we get this very nice signal. This very nice signal, we can identify it in our proton phosphorus correlation and so get the signature for the full molecule that then we go back to our J resolved, not different experiment anymore, and we get the different protons of this molecule that hereby we can assign to a molecule which is this case phosphoglyceric acid. So the aim of this whole procedure, which is actually now under revision in analytical chemistry, is to identify, not only detect, but also identify phosphorylated molecules in a very complex mixture. I hope I've shown you that NMR still has a lot of possibilities to look at the flow of carbon of labels through complex networks and thereby contribute to the understanding of these networks. And we're now trying to measure, for example, feedback experiments to see how certain metabolites will inhibit other enzymes by pharmacology derived experiments inside this framework of floxomics to understand how bacteria actually can reproduce itself.
So let me thank people over here. So Pierre has been involved in most of it. Neil is finishing his PhD thesis, uh, hopefully this year on this uh, subject. Cyril just joined the, well, joined a year and a half ago, the NMR group here in Toulouse. Eder Nalinste there and Jean-Charles there in charge of the MetaTool uh, NMR platform. Fabien is a professor, became now professor in pharmacology, has been, and together with Mikael, been working on the isoleucine uh, biosynthesis in bacteria. And Tony introduced me to general metabolomics. And so Davy Sinavo, who's here, who's now in Lille at CNRS, but who at this moment was still at the Manchester University and University of Ghent in Belgium. Thank you for your attention and please ask questions. Thank you, Guy. Um, so I think uh, you should be able to raise your hand to ask questions, I hope. If not, maybe just write something in the chat and then I'll, I'll uh, move you up into the spotlight. Any questions? I wanted to ask in your um, cell extract movie, what is your time resolution in the, in the, in that movie? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. At this moment, uh, we're aim. It's it's about sensitivity. Eh? How mm. much time can you get to to a decent spectrum? At this moment, we're aiming at below one minute, and so mm. we can actually do it at thirty seconds if we just take sixteen scans, where the most intense uh, metabolites we can follow them in a very rapid mm. way. But typically, we would use a minute. What is interesting is that we use a double reception with this new consoles, actually on the 800 megahertz, mm -hmm. we have double reception. Uh -huh. So we can at the same time look at proton and phosphorus NMR. Mm. So we actually acquire this at the same time where the phosphorus NMR is not as much used to detect the phosphometabolites, but rather to see the evolution of pH, which is a very important yes. thing. Yeah, we can actually follow the, the the evolution of pH in this extract in real time as well. Hmm. And uh, if I can continue in uh, in the, we looked at pure shift NMR at one stage in um, just un, untargeted proton uh, metabolomics, and um, we thought it was going to be too insensitive, but that's not the case in your hands. Um, we we've actually done it together with um, Cecile Canet at, at the um, at the INRA here, we, we tried as well, um, just an untargeted metabolomic mm. study where we had pig liver treated with um, oil X or oil mm. Y. So we first had done regular metabolomics where they managed to, with PCA kind of, to separate these two uh, samples. And then we did the same thing with pure shift and it mm -hmm. actually was kind of disappointing because we gave us the same time. And in the same time, pure shift actually only showed the most intense metabolites. So mm. indeed, we could distinguish two metabolites that were discriminating between the two groups. We could better distinguish them than with the one regular 1D experiment. Mm. But we lost six of the metabolites that were discriminating because they were below the threshold of detection if we gave ourselves exactly the same time. So yeah. sensitivity remains a problem for all these methods. Eh? And in, in terms of speed, do you use things like non-uniform sampling to, to speed up um, the position? Yeah, for, we, we would not do it for the J-resolved experiment mm. because what we basically do is we fold back the peaks. And so, so you see that the, the proton carbon coupling is between mm. 120 and one and 200 Hertz, but we can actually fold them in up to six times, which mm. means that we have a small window of 16 Hertz that we would sample with four or eight points. So there's not really a use to go below that with non-uniform sampling. Non-uniform sampling is what we would use for the proton carbon HSQC kind yeah. of experiments. Mm. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not seeing questions. No one out there with questions. If all it's not working in you, then you should write in the chat. Uh, again, it might have been too technical <laughs> for most people. I, I understand, but I think the what might be of interest is to say, well, okay, if we can make extracts, we can actually do real time following mm. up 
in these extracts, which by MS becomes mm -hmm. complicated because it means you could not put an LC step in front of it. It would be it's equivalent to direct injection mass spectroscopy. Yeah. For people who've done direct injection mass spectroscopy, um, that's not simple. Eh? That's mm. not simple because you get so many peaks that it's extremely hard to follow it. Yeah. Here in an MR tube, you can just put it in there and go for it. Yeah. Uh, maybe if there are no questions, I just one last one. When we when we went to eight hundred megahertz, we we looked we talked about getting better nosies, better resolution. Nine fifty, we get to optimal for trosy. The one point two, what's it go? Do you have an idea what it's going to bring to us? What, do you have any early indications from Florence? Or? Um, I think the general hope. Well, of course, sensitivity will be better. Mm -hmm. uh, resolution on itself will be better. But the general hope is that systems that are in exchange peaks that broaden, mm. that actually, so which means that they sample different states, that we could separate these different states, mm. and that, for example, if you say a protein which is ten percent unfolded, ninety percent folded, and that the mm. unfolded state kind of broadens even the folded resonances because there's this chemical exchange, that now at one point. This scales like delta omega squared. Mm. So going from 800 to 1.2 is not just a factor 1.5, mm. it's 1.5 squared. And so yeah. the hope is that we will be able to see substates of proteins a little bit in the way that Louis K has been uh, promoting yeah. it mm. by, by this uh, relaxation dispersion experiments yeah. that now we would directly see them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we'll need to find samples to that's the promise it's not clear at all whether we will find samples where we're in the correct window of both delta omega and mm. exchange rate but the first 1.2 gigahertz machines are just up and running now and eh? so the florence one is up and running uh, i think there's in in zurich there just one running at eth the Göttingen one quenched so, so they're putting it back on on field now. Um, yeah, it, it's it's not clear. It's not clear. And the the French one, the one which is going to be installed, is kind of unique in the sense that it's both for biomolecular NMR in liquid, mm -hmm. biomolecular NMR in solid. So there will be a probe, uh, proton carbon nitrogen, 0.7 millimeter turning at 110 kilohertz on it. Mm -hmm. But there will also be for material sciences. So they'll have two proton X thing, one for the low gamma nuclei, and therefore quadrupolar nuclei or 1.2 gigahertz might actually be more important because with quadrupolar nuclei, your line narrowing is again as the field squared. Mm -hmm. As Dominique Massio showed this already a long time ago in Tallahassee where they had a mm -hmm. one point something gigahertz machine running for a couple of minutes, eh? but they, they were able to, to, to get to a very high resolution spectrum on this. Okay, so if we don't have any questions, and no one's written in the chat, I think we thank you very much again for your for your time. And uh, hopefully we'll see you in person when when conditions allow. I hope so. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks so much. Bye. Bye to all. Now we can stay on a little if you like. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess the, again this is very technical for most people, eh? And and that's that's probably the thing. But but ah, we have a thank you very much in the chat. That's nice. Huh? We have a thank you very much in the chat. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, it, sure. It's it's technical, but it's also showing something a little bit different to uh, the structural biology that that many of us do. Um, you know, when I went to London, I had only done structural biology and then was sort of dragged into metabolomics and learned about things there. Uh, and so there are many, so many things you can do with NMR that uh, you know, we can put anything in the spectrometer. So um, yeah, it's just create, requires a bit of imagination of uh, in sample preparation. Yeah, we've been working here with Bruno Chaudray on, on the nanoparticle deterioration of molecules. Mm, I saw you could put nanoparticles in, in your thing and who cares it if, whatever whatever you want you could put it in in, in your nmr basically yeah yeah I I mean, think... we 
uh, my experience in London was that when I arrived, um, we had a 700, which had been purchased with a sample jet with the idea of doing drug discovery. And the drug discovery never happened. Um, but we had some physiologists and people started coming with urine and blood. Um, and this just grew and grew. And then, you know, you, you, we were doing saliva, placenta, whatever. Yeah. You can ask any. And so a little bit of targeted with C13 work as well. Um, yeah. Again, I think the application that I'm showing here mm. makes sense if you're in a lab where there's a lot of engineering, what yeah. I would call bacterial engineering. Mm. And people want to see within the bacterial context where their carbon flow goes. Mm -hmm. In that sense, it, it makes more sense to do this experiment because it's easy. Mm. You just buy C13 labeled glucose. If you want to know if it's the one position, but you buy C13 at the one position and, and you see where it, you immediately see where it goes through. Mm. Um, untargeted metabolomics, so this kind of, of PCA kind of stuff. Mm. Um, I've been quite reluctant to do this because First of all, from an NMR perspective, it's it's less. Uh, I saw your paper on on the on the Mount Everest. Uh, yes, people, which was kind of nice paper. <laughs> Specific is I pollution as well, so that was funny. Yes, I thought. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, you see, there's not a single NMR spectrum in the paper. I know, uh, the, spectro the spectroscopy is very dull. Um, yeah. But so, there, are, there, there are a lot of important results. So, you know, the, if you're, I, we were close to hospitals and there's so yeah. many, so many questions. I think these papers are extremely interesting. If you're interested in the research question and mm. NMR is now the technique, it's yeah. not about developing NMR anymore and you want it to be as robust as possible. Mm. So basically medical doctors want one button and that's it, eh? like an mm. imaging. Yeah. And I, th I think indeed it makes sense for this kind of things that you're, you have a very robust thing mm. and, and it runs like this. And again, well, in the project, so we might be together in a project with IPBS on the mycobacterial resistance, blah, blah, blah. The thing that Alain Boulard is, is, is coordinating. I, I'm not sure you're, you're aware of it or, or not. Or not. Uh, not sure. <laughs> okay. So, so Alain Boulard, he's a guy at the Pasteur Institute in Lille, with mm -hmm. whom I've been working for 20 years. So he's coordinating a project um, in which they're looking at drug resistance in mycobacteria. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so Olivier Nerol, your director is implied in, in, in some of the biology, blah, 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 thing like this. And Alain asked me, because we've known, I said, well, look, at a certain moment, we might have patient samples. Mm. Uh, would you want to, we have mass spec somewhere, but it might be interesting to do NMR in there as well. Mm -hmm. And so I said, okay, it's not what we're doing, but if, look, if I can help you, why not? And so this project is now under revision thing like this. And that's how I got in touch. Olivier Nerol actually contacted me. I think he's still see. online, if you want. I don't know. Olivier, are you still there? Let me see. I'll move him up and see if he may, may not yeah. be. Let's see. He is, I think. Yeah. I, I, Olivier, I I see you. I don't he see just, you. may just be left open. No, okay. not to worry. I'll move him back down. Okay. But, but so I contact him to say, well, that's the kind of a good way to, <laughs> to get in touch and see if we can do something together. And uh, okay, we're waiting for the results, but indeed, mm -hmm. I think it would be make sense that we kind of discuss who can do what in this thing. For them, you have more experience than I do, and Ooh. so I contacted. Well, <laughs> I contacted the people from the food uh, stuff. So at the Inra, mm. th they're doing this on on a regular basis because they're doing food analysis. Eh? Yes, pigs that are fed with one or the other one, and then they do the, this kind of metabolomics thing. Mm -hmm. We'll see, it's not clear what number of samples will come, what the question will be, but the NMR on itself is not interesting. No, no. no. What is interesting is, is the, the research question behind it. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And yeah. that's... Hmm. Okay, um, so we still have a few people uh, logged on. I don't think if they want to join in. Maybe not. If not, we can uh, maybe wrap up, and uh, but we'll keep in touch. We should have another chat some, sometime soon. Yeah, and, and perhaps if you want to come and visit, there's really no problem. And, and uh, 
we can perhaps discuss being at 10 meters distance. <laughs> it's so, it's not... <laughs> yeah, I'm very, I'm very uh, much on the uh, keeping my distance uh, as much as possible. Um, so, <laughs> but as soon as it's as soon as it, things are looking a little bit better, uh, I'd love yeah, to come. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I asked uh, Olivier Sorel whether we could use your HMS uh, mm. equipment at a certain moment. And so that's something that probably we will come and use in, in the next coming mm -hmm. weeks just to to have uh, some, some experiments uh, that are, again, pretty simple, but for us, interesting. Mm. Good. And again, it doesn't make sense that we would buy an HMS equipment knowing that, that at, at one kilometer, there's one. Sure that probably you don't use that that often and, and the same thing if, if you need time on an 800 yeah we can discuss it on the other way around as well eh? yeah what what probes do you have on the 800 we have uh three probes we have a proton carbon nitrogen phosphorus cryoprobe five millimeter okay Q, uh, qci yeah yeah mm -hmm. which is actually and it's a new one so we had we have had it since now a couple of months because our old one, the nitrogen channel was uh, mm. getting worse and worse. And we sent it for repair two years ago and they made it work rather than repaired it. Mm. So our nitrogen pulse moved from 30 something microseconds up to 46, mm. which is not very good. So, yeah. but now the new probe is doing pretty well. We have a 1.7 millimeter probe, mm -hmm. which is potent carbon phosphorus. Uh, yeah. and not nitrogen, but so which is interesting for the people with the metabolites and short amounts. And then we have a three millimeter BBI probe, a, a yeah. room temperature probe, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. I actually bought when just when arriving here, because mm -hmm. uh, if you only have cryo probe and your cryo platform breaks down, then you put yeah, in helium right. and nitrogen without doing any more. Yeah, yeah, true. So we, uh, I really insisted very hard in, on buying this probe, and mm. it, which is the same as we had on the 800 in Lille. Mm. And it's actually, I think it's a very good probe uh -huh. because on a three millimeter tube, you lose a little bit compared to the cryo because the cryo is five millimeter. Eh? Yeah. BBI. And, so is that, um, that will first, so that will do something like cadmium. Yes. Ah, interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, we, in, in Lille, we used it for cadmium at a certain hmm. point. But hmm. uh, again, the, the problem that we have here is that most of the community, community is interested in the cryoprobe. Hmm. So yeah. we really have to plan our campaigns. Sure. Or we have a problem with repair. And then we have the, 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 yeah. the, the probe in there and at least we can use sure. it. Or we say, well, typically, for example, in February, we're going to the 1.7 millimeter probe. Mm -hmm. And in between the five millimeter and the one point seven, probably we we'll leave a BBI. couple of days or a week for the BBI, and and run some things and um, more exotic things on it. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Well, it's, it's, it's good to meet you. <laughs> okay. We, Thanks a lot for the invitation. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Thanks. And again, so, so, so tell people for that. that 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 uh, my aim is not to go into spin operators that nobody understands anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I meant to say I appreciated your remarks about James Keeler. I say the same things. Uh, his book, you feel like you understand when you're reading it. Okay, when you close yeah. it, maybe not so much as stuck, but he's, he's an excellent teacher. I don't know him personally, but he's, it's yeah, so uh, good. He, he's an amazing per I actually know him personally, and mm -hmm. I've met him a couple of times, and... Uh, because Chris Dobson was actually, mm. I was with Chris Dobson in a project. And so mm. when he invited me to, I met James Keeler, he he deliberately did not want to go to, to be head of chemistry. Now he took mm. head of chemistry in 2018, mm. but he was 20 years, the thing that nobody yeah. wanted to be, teacher. head of teaching, mm. undergraduate teaching. Mm. But he, he's he's excellent. If you, He has written this book, Why Do Chemical Reactions Happen? It's it's an amazing book, but again, it's very deep because once you've read it, you think you've understood everything, and then you close it, and uh, well, you have to reopen it. To do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've I've used this book for some um, some workshops. You know, just reducing everything down to rotations, and you can work yeah. through a pulse sequence so so, so easily without. Yeah. If, you, if you open Ernst, you're you. Yeah, you don't get anywhere, but uh, yeah, and the clearly the, the course I'm teaching here at the INSA, mm -hmm. and there's no way I can even talk about the spin operator. 
Mm. If I talk about spin operator, these are bioengineers. Mm. They're lost from second minus five. Not the <laughs> uh, it's, yeah, it's hard to pitch and, it right. That's and sure. again, it's uh, I'm not even convinced that it's useful for. It's useful. You see, like this guy Neil Cox, who's, who's presenting his yeah. thesis this year. For him, it's useful because he's kind of going further and further in there. And when he makes the, the, this phosphorus selection thing, he mm -hmm. has kind of to know what he's doing. Uh, is that, is it, I have a Neil online. Is this Neil? Shall we put him in? Yeah. Him in. Is that Neil? Can I do that? Neil Cox. It's just as Neil. Yeah, yeah, it's probably it's him. Yeah, yeah, probably he's in there. So hi, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's in the opposite. No, again, so stood. Of course, it means also that the footstep for students to go in mm. becomes extremely high. Mm. And that's one of the major... I, I talked this week with Ulrich Gunther, yeah. you know, the guy who was at Birmingham and who yes. left Birmingham and, and went to Lübeck. Yeah. So, so we discussed for something. And what he told, I think it makes sense. He said, well, we have a big problem because we're not going to draw in new students anymore because the threshold is too high. Mm. And if, if we present it as you need spin operators and things like this, basically nobody comes. If you're doing MOS spec in metabolomics, nobody mm. talks to you about spin operators. Eh? No, no, no. So we have to be extremely careful to have still people who are technically enough to be able to advance the methods. Mm. But, but how to get them in by interest? And, and so clearly... It's not through spin operators. No. Uh, maybe uh, I don't know. I don't know where people like Malcolm Levitt or um, or, or Gareth, Gareth Morris find the people. Maybe coming from chemistry, from physics, or chemistry. Yeah, pure physical chemistry. Mm -hmm. Indeed, they might get them in. But in biology, where there's a lot of money, let's be clear, mm -hmm. most of the money are in biological applications. David Sinav, he told me that Garrett Morris does the method development and in the end, he looks for pharmacology. Mm. What molecule could fit my method? <laughs> That's not a good thing. That's not a good thing because that means you make a small methods lab, whereas mm. mostly the question is, well, what question do they have? I mean, here, our protein project is people say this enzyme eats a plastic bottle. How does it do it? Mm. And then we can say, well, we want soluble substrates and things like this. And they say, we're not interested. We want a plastic bottle. Mm. We're interested to know how this protein eats the plastic bottle, not about model substrates or kind of stuff like this. Mm. So I think NMR has to adapt to the real questions mm. and perhaps say, well, we don't know. We can't do it. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If, if you go to NMR meetings, uh, you see we're very close to, onto one another. Eh? It's always the same people. Uh, and, and it's very much method development on ubiquity, I would say. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah and the H3s. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> H3s. So I think in that sense, we, we do have a problem, and specifically when an MR gets so expensive. Yeah, yeah. This, I, th I think on the on the subject matter, it's not, it's not you know, the there are many people are doing things beyond ubiquitin and SH3 and this whole interest in IDPs. But um, I think it is a case of finding where we can be, where we, we can work best, where we can bring the most. And it's, it's not necessarily in determining the structure of something. Um, it's much, much more going beyond that now. There has to be. Yeah, and so you need to, basically you need people who have the questions that are uh, interaction mapping, this kind of stuff is, 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 is an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. And even in drug discovery, yes, indeed. Uh, I, th I think it's in the, the, the very good um, thermometer of the thing is, is if you look what's done in industry. Eh? Mm. So industry has lost protein structure by NMR. Mm. Well, it's not true that they've lost it. They've never gotten into it. Mm. They've never, I, I don't know one single industry who actually at a certain moment said, what we're now going to do is to do the structure of the proteins by NMR. Perhaps oh, Steve Fassick at Abbott. Yeah, no, well, yes, but they're doing all the drug discovery side as well. Um, 
when I was a postdoc in the, at Merrill Dow in Strasbourg, we, we did we were allowed to do what we liked. So we did structure, protein structure. Uh, yeah, but, yeah, but that's it's rare. Twenty years ago. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, nineties. Yeah. So, so again, it, it never took off. I know uh, one of our first students. He, he worked at at the Roche in, mm. in Basel. And at a certain moment, they decided to actually to close the NMR and they basically told them, look, you can go to Boston if you want to, or do something completely else in the rush. And he took the right decision to do something completely else in the rush. Eh? Because mm -hmm. after all, it, 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 even Vertex is not doing it anymore. Mm -hmm. And Vertex, who bought the first 800, the first 900 in the, in the US, blah, 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 for, for, for industry things, it's too expensive. It's too yeah. slow. If you have yeah. to buy three PhDs, three postdocs, three whatever PhD level people just to, to make these things, you don't do it. And now cryo yeah. EM is wiping it out. But people like uh, Aztecs are still still active. Yeah. Aztecs is, uh, well, Mark worked with Aztecs. And yes. I, I actually know the guy who is doing modeling. Johnny, mm -hmm. he, he was a postdoc with us in Lille. And uh, Aztex is, is, yeah, has invested a huge amount of money in cryo mm. uh, because that's how they're hoping specifically GPCRs, eh? that this mm. kind of stuff, and tried for a little while NMR on GPCRs, as, as your lab did, actually, I think, mm. Alain was, was in this kind of, mm. GP, but not on the structure level. Mm. You will never get to the structure of a GPCR no. by... by uh, at best, you can do some interaction mapping and some kind of STD or transfer NOE or, or whatever. But mm. I, it's not realistic to do, to do this. Yeah. No, no, no. But then often the structure isn't the most interesting question. It's not going to be a surprise for, these, for many things. No, no. The, the structure on itself is not a question. It's mm. not a bio, It's like saying we get the assignment of an IDP. Eh? Mm. I, yeah. I actually discussed this with, with uh, Dr. Loken, the head of Brooker now, the, mm. from Loken and things like this. And, and so he was there with his bark, dark proteome, blah, 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 and Amara is going to solve IDPs. Mm -hmm. and, like this. and I said, look, Dr. Loken, what's the question? Mm. If the yeah. question is, can we get to the assignment of tau, the answer is yes. But mm. who cares? <laughs> who cares about the assignment of tau? No, the question has to be more something more interesting. And in Tau it is, yeah. Yeah, but the, the question, well, even in Tau it is, but at this moment, the the, the last two years, mm. everything we've seen comes from cryo -EM mm. because we've had the structures of fibers isolated from the brains of mm. deceased people. Mm. They are completely different from everything we've done in vitro, completely different. Hmm. Both for Alzheimer, for Pick's disease, for cortical basal d d disease, and things like this. So, again, what can we do? And, and I, I got in, in a fight with Zweckstetter and, and Griesinger like this, because they are still claiming that they're doing it is relevant, but it's not. It's, it's completely irrelevant. Uh... Yeah, but, but things like uh, effects of phosphorylation, these kind of things are, are interesting. Sure, huh? sure. But again, we, it's interesting if you do it in the context of a neuron, mm. because these things do, well, we published the PNS paper where we show that phosphorylation at the 202, 205 side mm. and not the 208 side can lead to aggregation. Mm. And Michel Goethe was actually a reviewer on the paper, the guy from the MRC and things mm. like this. So we got very well along. And I told him the title is that this phosphorylation pattern can drive aggregation. Mm -hmm. I don't say that it is driving aggregation in the brain. I don't I have no clue. Mm. And if so I can, want, the course. only way I can go is to, to, to go to the brain. Mm. <laughs> <And> so <laughs> the title is, it, but it's important. It's important that we show that a phosphorylation pattern can drive aggregation, mm -hmm. which before people were not even sure of. Now, if yeah. this is true in a brain, in a human brain, well, the only way we can do it is, is look at what's happening in the human brain. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, in the fibers, they don't see this phosphorylation region. Uh -huh. They don't know. They don't see it. Mm -hmm. So, again, I got well along with Michel and he told me, look, we don't know whether it means that it's un not homogeneously phosphorylated mm -hmm. or that it's not a stable structure 
or that it's because it's a, a mixture of the different six different forms, isoforms, we don't know. That it's the only thing we can say. But again, yeah. so we showed that it's possible. They say we don't know, which leaves open the possibilities. Yeah. But again, when we saw the structures of so that, that's the paper of 2017 on Christmas, it came out. Everybody said, "Wow, wow!" It's th the most amazing thing that saved research on Alzheimer's disease is that they show in the paper that three patients they had the same things. Mm. If they had had different fibers, three Alzheimer patients, mm. then clinical research was dead on Alzheimer. It would mean that everybody has its own Alzheimer disease. <laughs> How are you going to yeah. against this? And as, as Michelle told me, she said it was actually we were that afraid that we would find different fibers in every patient now the best thing is that the alzheimer patients now there are 19 structures they're 19 identical mm -hmm. the pig's disease they're identical but different from alzheimer uh -huh. so the fibers are disease specific mm -hmm. but not patient specific yeah in vitro there's no way we can find is it there's no way. And, and so again, so we have to adapt and, and we wrote a re review toe in the era, in the era of cryo EM. Mm. The only thing we can say is indeed the world has changed. So our NMR approach has to change with it. Mm -hmm. Hard times, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, we keep in touch and um, yep. we meet up as soon as we can. Great. Thanks, you. Okay. And uh, if, if you're listening, thanks for arranging all this. It's still online. I don't know. <laughs> See you. Bye -bye. See you soon.